I want to read to you a deal that I found on Facebook this past week, and I just kind of thought it was funny, but it was a, uh, it was a post actually one of my family members from North Carolina made, and here's what it says. It says, the Bible says the first time God destroyed the earth by water, and he promised never to do that again. He went on to say, I will destroy it by fire the second time. I won't even pretend I understand all of the book of Revelation, but I do understand quite plainly that I do wish to spend eternity in heaven. I have been hearing about the second coming of Christ and the events unfolding for most of my life. The mark of the beast, artificial intelligence, microchips, no cash, digital currency, total government, dependency um, control. We are, we are, when we are raising a family, working long hours, some two jobs, lots of things go unnoticed or just get ignored. No one can comprehend how bad it will be, but we see it happening bit by bit on the news every day. While the devil is preparing people for the Antichrist, God is preparing people for the rapture. I don't know when the rapture will take place, but I know that I'm not planning to be left behind when the trumpet sounds. I also believe right now that God has given us a chance to turn our lives around and live according to his will. We need to get the gospel message out until the good Lord calls me away from this, day, from this world to go home. I want to make it clear that I believe in Jesus Christ as the one and only true Lord and Savior. Despite the fact that I am human and I fail a lot, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the best challenge I have seen on Facebook. And so basically what it was is they're, they're getting people to, to repost this challenge and to tell people where they stand. But what it said in there is exactly what we talked about last week. The reason that we are doing this study at this point in time, one, it's challenging me as a pastor, but I wanted to challenge y'all as well because I wanted to, the objectives of this is that I want us to get to the point where we're so comfortable with the text that we're not afraid to study it. I want us to be so comfortable with the text that we're not afraid of every news story and every event that happens because we can look at things like today. There was a school shooting today up in one of the, uh, Midwestern states. There was a, a shooting at the parade for the Chiefs uh, celebration deal today. Over one person was killed. Twenty people are, are injured. I think seven or eight of them are critical. Um, and so it's just a bad situation. And and if we if we get wrapped up in the headlines, we we, we just get our mind thinking, oh my, it's it's happening tomorrow. It's happening tomorrow. Now these are certainly signs of the times, and we need to be able to recognize those signs. But we don't need to panic. Every time that a headline or an election or something takes place. And so I want us to be able to recognize those signs of the times and begin to understand that those things will be taking place and they're going to come eventually. And so last week we looked at uh, the, the first three verses of Revelation, kind of gave a, a little bit of an overview of the book and, and talked about it being an apocalyptic literature and how that was different from prophecy. We talked about John a little bit and how he, who he was and what he had seen and what his authority was, and we're going to look at a little bit more of that tonight, to, was to write and to, uh, to, to, uh, to put this out there. I mean, we, took, we looked at the fact that the Revelation is, is, a, uh, is a book about the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's not, it's, it's not a revelation about Jesus. It's, it's a revelation of Jesus, and this is a revelation given by Jesus and we see that through Scripture. Uh, the revelation begins with God, right? And it's what we talked about. And it's, and it's God's truth um, that brings Jesus. And, and the Bible, well, like we said last week, never makes a second God out of Jesus. Jesus in his human form shows his dependence and talks about his dependence on God. And we see that in, through several pieces of Scripture. You'll see that on the notes that I gave you from last week if you didn't get, get that. But, but John is sent an angel to hear this revelation of Jesus Christ. And so it's given to John. John gives it to us. And then he says that, look, it's a blessing for those who read it. It's a blessing for those who hear it. And it's a blessing for those that not only hear it, but to do the things that, that go along with that. And so tonight we're going to jump into verses four through nine, uh, four through eight. And um, there's quite a bit that we need to unpack there. Uh, and so I want to read that to you. Then we're going to jump into it and begin to look at some of these different things that we see. But in, in verse 4, it says this. John, he's introducing himself to the seven churches in the province of Asia. Grace and peace to you from, who, from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits before this throne and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness 
the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. So now let's talk about, let's just jump into the first part. We know it was John who wrote it, but he, he mentions right off the bat, this is to the, the, uh, the seven churches in the province of Asia. This is not all of Asia as we know it today. This would be what we consider Asia Minor. Uh, Asia Minor was a, uh, a western uh, sea coast. Uh, right up there on the, on the Mediterranean. It was a lot smaller. It was kind of a, uh, it was more of a Roman province back in that time. So it's not everything that we think of Asia today. It was much, much smaller, but it was a, it was a place that carried these seven churches that were very specific. And we'll talk about more of those in just a little bit. More than anything else, this represents, the seven churches represents a time period. Now, if you go back and you look at your, your, uh, your timeline, when, we, when, when Christ ascends into heaven, that begins what we call the church age. And so that puts us in Revelation 1 through 3. We are living currently in the church age. And so the seven churches represent the church age. And, it's, and, it's, and it's, the number seven uh, is specific because it is a, is a number of completion. And so what's happening is that these, this, 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 is, this is God's way of t- communicating with all churches that are his churches. Now, there are some people who believe that John picked these particular seven churches because he had a special leadership in them, that he had put, was part of their, their, uh, their, their beginning. He had special... Um, uh, authority in them, and he used them to speak to other churches. There are other people who think that John picked these particular seven churches because they were kind of the mail distribution points uh, for all the other outlets and provinces and villages and all the other places where all the if, the, if the letter went there, then it would go out from there on, into all the other places. So it was kind of like a, uh, a distribution center, so to speak. Uh, however, we need to understand that it's not John's revelation. It's God's revelation. And it's his revelation to his churches. And so with that idea that this is completeness, what, what's happening is what God's saying is what we're about to give you to these churches, these seven representing complete churches, is that we are talking to churches all over the place. Now, what we're not talking about is a universal church, right? We're talking about God's individual bodies of churches uh, that are expressed locally. And what that looks like is North Shore Church. What it looks like are all the other churches that are dotted around this community and around the state, the United States, and wherever else around the world that we see these. These are bodies of Christ that are expressed locally, and these are people who have bound themselves together by a covenant, and have basically said, look, we're going to do life together. God has given me talents. He has given you talents, and we're going to take those talents, and we're going to take those gifts, and we're going to bind together by covenant, and we're going to do the things that God has given us purpose to do. He has given us resources to do, and we're going to grow the kingdom of God in that way. Now, that's the idea that we're to expand the kingdom of God. Understand this, and I believe this with all of my heart, that when God gets ready to do business, and I mean serious business, I believe he does it through the local church. Remember a few weeks ago, we talked about, um, um, we talked about revival. And I said that revival doesn't necessarily start with a group, and it doesn't start with a particular uh, idea, it starts within the heart of the individual. 
right? And I believe that revival starts within the heart of individuals within the church, and the church begins to see that revival take place within its own body. And because that revival cannot be held within the, the four walls of that church, that it, it, it goes out from there and then begins to create revival outside of the church. Well, the same thing is true here. When God gets ready to do serious business, he does it through his local church body. And because that church body is the expression of who he is here on earth. And so the people that live together, that worship together, that minister together, they go out and they do the work of the Lord, the work that, that God has given us to do because... It is the churches that, it, that, it, that Jesus tells us in Matthew 16, 18, when he's talking to, uh, to Peter, and he says, it's the churches that the gates of hell shall not prevail against, right? And so it, when God gets ready to do serious business, it, it is no doubt in my mind that he gets ready to do th- through the local churches, and I believe that's what he's doing here in this letter, is he's specifically writing to these particular churches, but he is writing to the ch- God's church as a whole and he's getting ready to do business with them. Now, some people might say, well, J.J., other organizations do great work. Yeah, they do. And those are what we call parachurch organizations, and they do great ministry. You see things like over-under ministry and all kinds of different ministries. Those are not church ministries. Those are, those are what we call parachurch ministry, and those, those, those still do incredible work, and they do the work that needs to be done. But I, I really believe with all my heart that when God gets ready to do serious business, he, he, he goes through the local church uh, in order to do that. Now, the greatest honor of our lives, and I, I also believe this, is that we are able to live in the church age. And here's why I say that. Because within the church age, we have the full indwelling of the Holy Spirit. They didn't have that before Acts. They didn't have that uh, in, in the time that Jesus walked the face of the earth, and they certainly did not have, have that in the Old Testament. We have the privilege of having the full indwelling of the, of the Holy Spirit. We have the full re- revelation of Scripture, of the Bible. We have the ability to be part of a local church, and it's, it's, and it's an honor, not just another club, uh, but to be, ex- be, to be, an ex- be in the expressed body of Christ, because it should be exciting. It should be something that we're excited about. It should be something that we're excited to bring people into, right? There's a lot of churches out there that, quite honestly, they're, they're, they're dried up, they're dead, there's nothing taking place in them. There's no, there's no gospel, sharing of the gospel that's taking place. There's no community activity taking place. There's no feeding of the homeless. There's no taking care of those that, that can't, can't, can't take care of themselves. There's just nothing going on. And that's, that's sad because the churches should be living up to the, to, to the things that God has called us to do. And that is to share the gospel, to grow God's kingdom, and to make that happen. And so when he's talking to the seven churches in the province of Asia, that's who he's talking to. He's talking to his church in this church age and dealing with that. And then he goes on to, to say grace and peace to you from him who is and him who was and him who is to come. And so we're talking about the eternal Christ here. John begins here by sending them the grace and peace of God. Now, what the grace and peace of God is, is these are all the undeserved gifts of the love of God. These are all the undeserved gifts of the love of God, the, the grace that he gives us, the ability to be forgiven when we don't have to be forgiven, but he forgives us anyway. The, the, the ability for, to him to, to not hold our sin against us. And it doesn't mean that he's, he's changed the rules and said, all right, well, because you lied, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to make lying a sin anymore. It's not what he does. He has replaced, he has replaced our sin with his perf- perfection. And that's the grace that we have. And so he says all the undeserved gifts and the love of God, that's the grace that we have. And because of that grace, it allows us the harmony of a restored relationship uh, w- between us and God. And that's the peace. You cannot, have, you cannot have peace without first having grace. And so you always see them in that context together. Peace always follows grace, and without grace there can be no peace. And then John sends a blessing from him who was, uh, from, him, from him who is, from him who was, and him who is to come. And this is a common title for God uh, in, in Scripture. You go back and, and I'll write this down. We won't turn there right now, but write this down. Exodus chapter 3, 
in verse 14. This is when God is talking to Moses from the burning bush. And what he says, God said to Moses is, I am who I am. When, 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 when Moses said, who am I speaking to? And God says, I am who I am. And what Jewish rabbis taught is that by saying that, God meant that he was before the beginning of time. He is the God of this time. And he will be God long after this time has ended. And so that was the idea of the Jewish thought. And then we get into the New Testament. We get into the time of Jesus. And the writer of Hebrews puts it perfectly in, verse, in chapter 13 and in verse 8 when he writes, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And so we see the eternal Christ being represented here uh, in these first few verses where, uh, where John is writing on this revelation and he's kind of introducing the text. And then he goes from there, grace and peace to you from him who was and him, him who is and him who was and who is to come. And then he says, from the seven spirits before the throne. Now, let's talk about who these seven spirits are because there's a lot of different ideas as to what these could be. I'm going I'm to float a couple of them out there to you. I'm going to show you some examples of, the, of, of what, where their argument comes from in Scripture. And then we're, we're going to land on what I think, uh, well, where in my opinion, which is where I land on the particular script. But I'm going to let you kind of look at it and see it and make your own decisions. But here, who are what are the seven spirits? Okay, two different ideas that have been floated out there. Uh, and the first one comes from the book of Enoch. Now, if you are not familiar with the book of Enoch, how many of you are familiar with the book of Enoch? You've probably heard it referred to. How many of you actually know what it is? Book of Enoch, okay, good, is a, is a, is a Jewish text, a historical Jewish text that was written by the great-grandfather of Noah. Okay, and so that's, that's how far back this particular Jewish text goes. The book of Enoch refers to and teaches of the seven first white ones. Now, what that's alluding to are archangels who stand ready and enter before the glory of the Lord. Now, huh? Are the first seven white ones, right? White ones. Now, out of context, that sounds very racist, but it's, it has nothing to do with race whatsoever. It has everything to do with uh, these are archangels, right, who stand ready and enter before the glory of the Lord. Now, for those who buy into this particular theological idea, they will find biblical support for that. If you flip over to Romans chapter 8, or not Romans chapter 8, Revelation chapter 8, and you look in verse 2, it follows Verse 1, now what you'll find in verse 1 is the idea that, um, that we know that men will be in heaven about 30 minutes before women will get there. Y'all have heard this joke, right? <laughs> if you read verse 1, what it says is when, when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. <laughs> yeah. Y'all have heard that joke? Yeah. I'm not here to entertain, but there will be a tip jar at the back. Um, but in verse 2, it says, And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Now, angels, as great as they are, they are still created beings, and they don't necessarily fit the description of what is being laid out in, what, in John's introduction right here. So there's other people who try to connect the idea of the seven churches with the seven spirits. But that's not backed up by anything that we find in Scripture, right? Now, if you've got your Bibles, turn over to Isaiah chapter 11. And this is where I believe, and most scholars that I've studied, and most theologians that I've studied, believe this is where the Bible um, answers itself, Remember, anytime you're, you're looking at Scripture and you're building theology, you never want to build theology off of one Scripture or one story in Scripture. You always want to let Scripture in its entirety build your theology. If there's ever something that's spoken in Scripture, chances are God didn't know what he was doing, and he answers it in Scripture somewhere else. But we just need to know where to find it. We, I believe that happens here in Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 2. It says, a shoot, in verse, we'll start in verse 1. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse, 
And from his roots, a branch will bear fruit. Now, this branch is, is, is the Messiah. And it says, the spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel, and the spirit of power. The spirit of knowledge and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. We believe, I believe, and scholars believe that this is the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And so in, back in Revelation, where it, it talks about uh, this, from the seven spirits before his throne, we believe this to be a, a description of the Holy Spirit. Um, when it, the, the, very, the very first um, spirit that is recognized there is the, the spirit of rest. Think back to Jesus' baptism, that the, the Holy Spirit came and landed on Jesus like a dove, and it rested there on him. That is one of the, the first descriptions of him. The, the, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of might or strength, the spirit of knowledge, and the spirit of fear. And so it is, it is this biblical reference that most scholars will point to as an answer to what the seven spirits before the throne of God actually are. And so uh, that's, where you, that's where you'll find that. So again, there's, there's different philosophies out there. There's th- different takes out there. Some believe it's archangels. Others believe it's the seven churches. Uh, but most scholars would tell you it, it, it's described, it's a it's description of the Holy Spirit. And we find that description in Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 2. Then he goes into some titles of Jesus. Remember last week we talked about there's a bunch of titles uh, given to Jesus throughout Revelation. I think we said nine of those are found in the first chapter alone. And here's three of them right off the bat. He, he says, um, he says um, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the king's of the earth. So the first title that is given here is the witness. And this idea of a witness is, and this is not anything mind blowing, but the, the idea of a witness is, is a person who speaks from firsthand knowledge. We know that God, that Jesus was with God in the beginning. We see that in John chapter one and verse one. You go back over there and it says, "In the beginning, God. Or in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God." We know that Jesus was with Him from the very beginning, and so we understand that Jesus has come from heaven. He has come from God himself. And he is a witness to everything that God is. He is a witness to his completeness. He is a witness to his power. He is a witness to his, uh, his wisdom and his, uh, just his creativity. He's a witness to it all. And so he is, he is a witness because that's first-hand knowledge of God. And we see this, this idea and this theme recurring throughout the New Testament. Um, write these verses down in John chapter 3, verse 11. John chapter 3, verse 11. This is what Jesus says. Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen. But still, you people do not accept our testimony. There's this idea of being a witness. In John chapter 18, in verse 37, this is where Jesus says to Pilate, In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. So it's this idea, look, I am am a witness of God. I am a witness of everything that he is. And I am here to tell you all about him. And then John uh, gives him the title of the firstborn. Now, this title of firstborn should be taken in two different ways. Two different ways. The first way it should be taken is in reference to the resurrection where Jesus gained victory over death. And so because he gained victory over death, everyone who believes in him has, has the ability to share in that victory. All right? And... It is also in reference to being the firstborn son to which the, to which the inheritance of power and honor is given. So that was very commonplace back in that day. Wes was talking about this weekend that families didn't, you know, kids didn't grow up, go away to college and then move away like they do now. 
families stayed together. And so you were talking about generations of family living together. The lineage and the inheritance within those families always passed down through the firstborn son. And so that was very common and very idealistic at that point in time. And so when, 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 when John writes this, it needs to be taken in both the idea that he was the firstborn in reference to his resurrection. He is also the firstborn in reference to the inheritance that he receives and that we receive as, 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 as children of his. And we see it in the way that Paul writes in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15 when he speaks of Jesus as the firstborn over all creation. He means that Jesus is Lord of the dead and he is Lord of the living, meaning there is not a part in this world or in the world to come and nothing in death in which Jesus Christ is not Lord. So that's a, that's a big title for him. To be. He's a witness. He's, he's seen who God is. He's seen everything that he's, that he's about, his power and everything else. And he is a witness to that. And he is the firstborn, which means he is, he is the firstborn in, in reference to the resurrection. He is the firstborn in reference to the inheritance that he receives. And then he says you, he, he is also ruler of kings. Now, it's one of those moments where John refers back to an Old Testament uh, uh, piece of scripture, and you'll find it in Psalm 89 and verse 27. Psalm 89 and verse 27. Here's what the psalmist writes. He says, And I will appoint him to be my firstborn, the most exalted of the kings of the earth. Now, this has always been taken by Jewish scholars to be a description of the coming Messiah. Right to be the kings, to be the kings of the earth, the, the exalted king of all the earth. So, for John to say that Jesus and to, to give him this title is the ruler of the kings of the earth, is to make a solid claim that Jesus is the Messiah. The, John knew what he was doing. Remember when we're looking at the Bible, we're looking at a Jewish text. We're looking at people from a Jewish background who have written this text, and they have this knowledge. They have been taught this their whole life. They are able to make the connections because this is the way that they have been taught. So there, there we are. we got the, the witness, the firstborn, and then the ruler of the kings. And then he goes on to, to, uh, to say this, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. So we're going to be looking. He, he introduces not only him by titles, but he also starts to let, here's the ministry of Jesus. Here's what this begins to look like. Notice in that first phrase, it says, to him who loves us. That is a present tense phrase, meaning his love, he loved us. When he, when he began, he loved us when he created us. He loved us when he came down to earth and, 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 and lived a perfect life and died for our sins. He, he loves us still to this day. That is a present tense uh, phrase that lets us know the ongoing and continuous love of God. Right? And then he says that Jesus freed us. Now, that is a past tense. It means he, he, he committed one act. And that act took care of sin for us all one time. It's not an act that needs to be done over and over again. It was one act done by a perfect sacrifice, Jesus Christ, that allows us to be able to be redeemed and purchased by the blood of the Lamb, which is what John writes in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 9. Uh, you can turn over there real quick if you've got it open, but Revelation chapter 5 and verse 9. Here's what it says. And they sang a new song. You're worthy to, to, uh, to take the scroll and to open the seals because you were slain with your blood. You purchased men for God from every tribe and every language and people in every nation. So that is what happens in here. He loves us. That's present tense. He freed us. That pa that's past tense showing the one act that, that of love on the cross that, we were, that liberated us from sin. And uh, it's what Paul meant when he wrote in Galatians 3.13 that we were redeemed from the curse of the law. 
But all of that was done during that period of time. And then he says, this Jesus made us a kingdom. Now, let's go back to what Wes was talking about on Sunday morning, for those of you who are here. The idea of a society, a group of people living together, working toward the same goal, moving in the same direction. Jesus made us a kingdom. He made us a society. And we see this quote, uh, again, this is an Old Testament quote uh, from Exodus chapter 19 in verse 6. You just write that down. We won't turn over to it right now. It says, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So again, the Bible answers itself. The Bible has consistency all the way through it. What we see in Revelation is what we've, what we've seen in the Old Testament. Over and over again, these same things are said. And, and if we don't ever put, put them together, we never see the consistency of Scripture. And when you get, begin to put them together, you think to yourself, man, this is kind of crazy. I mean, if you don't believe that, that God knew what he was doing when he was, writing the, when he was putting uh, Scripture down on paper through all the different writers and all the different uh, eras, I mean, he knew exactly what he was doing. Uh, in the Exodus 19 section, you will be for me a, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And he says that Jesus gives us, has given us royalty, right? Through Jesus, we become true children of God. Uh, if we are children of the King of Kings, which is what we found out earlier on, that he is, he is the ruler of all kings. So if we are children of the King of Kings, then we are part of the royal family of God means we have a title, we have an inheritance, we have position, we have purpose. Is anybody, is anybody watch Netflix by chance? Has anybody watched The Crown on Netflix? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a documentary, not really a documentary, but it's a, it's a series that's done about the royal family in England. And it talks about their, their background and my, over the, the Christmas holidays, my My wife and my daughter and I sat down and we watched all like six or seven seasons. I don't know how many there were. It was a lot. Um, But what you get is you get a good idea of what it looks like to be in a royal family. I don't know if everything's true in there, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't, certainly wouldn't tell you to go and, and make, your own, make your opinions based upon everything that you've seen. I'm sure they took some artistic uh, gratuity in there at some point. But you see what it takes to be a part of a royal family. Each one of those people in the, in, the, uh, in the family, they have a title. There's not anybody in the family that doesn't have a title. You're either a prince or you're a princess or you're a duke of some, something. Or, but everybody's got a title and they've got a purpose within the family. Now, not everybody figures out what their purpose is. And not everybody in, their, in, in, the, in the royal family likes their purpose. I think you can see that with the, uh, the redheaded one right, right now. He, he didn't like the fact that he wasn't first, right? And so it's, it's caused him some problems. And he's left the royal family and he's kind of abdicated any of his responsibilities. And yet there was an article yesterday that says he still uses his title when he goes out places, which is kind of comical to me. He wanted to get away from it. So everybody's got a title. Everybody's got a purpose. Everybody has an inheritance And that is the same thing that we find in our relationship with the Lord is that we have that inheritance. We have a title that's been given to us, and that's sons and daughters of the king. And because of that, that makes us part of the royal family of God. And 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 he's given that that name uh, to Jesus. Jesus gives us royalty. And then he is, he goes on, he says, Jesus has made us priest. Uh, Under the old Old Testament law and under the, under the, uh, the way things worked in the, uh, the Jewish uh, religion, priests were the ones that had access to God, right? Um, priests were the ones that would, would go into the Holy of Holies, and they were the ones that would present before the altar the, the sacrifices for the sins of the people. Like the, the people could go into the, the tabernacle, they could go into the temple, and there were places that they could go into, but then there were only places that all the priests could go into. And then beyond that, there was the Holy of Holies that only one priest could go into. And they had to tie a rope to their foot just in case something happened to them while they were in there so that they could be pulled back out because people were not allowed to go into the presence of God. right? And so that was the role of the priest in Old Testament times and in the Jewish uh, religion, and that's what it looked like. Now, 
We have become priests from, of, of, of God. And then we see this prophesied in Isaiah in chapter 61 in verse 6, where, where Isaiah writes, you shall be called priest of the Lord. Now, what that means is, is that it is our job to honor God and to honor his people through sacrifice and through service, because that's what a priest did. It on, they honored God and honored his people through sacrifice and through service. Now, so the, the role has not changed. It's still a role that we, 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 we should be doing today and to um, working on today. Now, we get into this last part, and this is a, uh, a, this is a quote from the Old Testament. But he says in verse 7, he says, Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him. Now, let me say this. That word clouds there, when you read in Scripture clouds, you need to read it in context. Sometimes clouds means clouds, right? There are other times that clouds means God's people are coming with him, right? And so the, here he says, look, he is coming with the clouds. He is coming with the saints. This is a picture of Jesus coming in and all the saints of, of God coming in behind him and we're, we're getting ready to do battle and every eye will see him even those who pierced him and all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him now here's what it here's what it means the coming glory of God is to Christians the coming of Christ is a promise that we look forward to and let me show you where we see this in scripture and it's going to take us back to Daniel chapter 7. So if you've got your Bible, flip over here. It's important enough for us to go and look at this. Go back to Daniel chapter 7. We're going to look at one of the, the, uh, the prophecies that Daniel made. And we're going to just, I'm going to read to you the first 14 verses of this particular uh, prophecy. It says, in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions passed through his mind as he was lying on his bed. He wrote down the substance of his dream. Daniel said, in my vision at night, I looked and there before me were, four, were, were the four winds of heaven churning up the great sea, four great beasts, and I'll name them as we go through them, each different from the others came up out of the sea. The first one, and if you want to mark this in your Bible, was like a lion, and that is representative of Babylon. The first one was like a lion, and it had the wings of an eagle. I watched until its wings were torn off, and it was lifted from the ground so that it stood on two feet like a man, and the heart of a man was given to it. Verse 5 and there before me was a second beast. Now, this is the second beast is representative of Persia, which looked like a bear. It was raised up on one of its sides, and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. It was told, get up and eat your fill of flesh. Verse 6, after that, I looked, and there before me was another beast, one that looked like a leopard. This is representative of Greece. And on its back... It had four wings like those of a bird. This beast had four heads, and it was given authority to rule. Verse 7, after that, in my vision at night I looked, and there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. You can just mark right there, that is representative of Rome and the Roman government. It had large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the former beasts, and it had ten horns. While I was thinking about the horns, there before me was another horn, a little one, which came up among them, and the three of the first horn and, and, and three of the first horns were uprooted before it. This horn had eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth that, ha that spoke boastfully. As I looked, now catch this clearly. It says, as I looked, thrones were set in place, and the ancient of days took his seat. 
That's talking about God. The Ancient of Days is God. His clothing was as white as snow. The hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. Verse 11, then I continued to watch because of the boastful words the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. The other beasts had been stripped of their authority, but were allowed to live for a period of time. In my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like the Son of Man. That is talking about Jesus. Coming with the clouds. Again, we're not talking about real clouds here. We're talking about God's saints. With the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. To Christians, the coming of Christ is a promise that we look forward to. It is something that we anticipate. It is something that we should be excited about and looking forward to. That means that when we see these headlines and we see these elections that don't go our way and we see things that devastate people and we have events in our lives that are devastating to us, that we can look past those things and we can get past those things because we anticipate the coming of Christ. We know that there's something bigger that is going to be happening in the end and we look forward to that. Now, to non-believers, the coming of Christ is terrifying. To non-believers, that's going to be a critical thing. And, and John quotes the Old Testament again back here in Revelation and, and, he, and he quotes Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10. And here's what he writes, Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. He says, they will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. Now, the first reference here is to those who actually crucified Jesus. Right? The first reference is they will look at the one they have pierced. And he says, look, he who is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. The first reference is to those who actually crucified Jesus. The second reference here is to those in every generation who crucified Jesus again and again through their sin and their opposition to him. This is who he's talking about. And this is what he's, he's dealing with as he's, as, he's, as he's talking about the coming glory of the Lord. Now, we read all that and we think, man, that's, that's, there's a whole lot going on in just those, those, uh, those four verses. And he, and he finishes with the, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. He reemphasizes who he is, that he was before time began, he was the God of this time, and he will be the the God of the time far beyond this time has ended. He is is always going to be that God. And, And John makes these statements of who he is. He makes a very clear declaration that Jesus is the Messiah. And he is referring back to Old Testament and Jewish knowledge to emphasize that to the people who would be reading this and to the church's uh, those seven churches um, that we'll, we'll take a look at next week. And not only this, those particular seven churches, but the churches of the, um, the church age, which is to us as well. And so we have to take all that in. Now, next week, we're going to be looking at verses 9 
through 19. And there's a lot we're going to dive into uh, during that particular time. And I'm hoping that we have enough time next week to be able to get all of it. And then after that, we're going to start from verse 20 and we're going to start looking at each one of these individual churches. And so if you have an opportunity, read ahead. If you've got a study Bible, read ahead and look at all the the notes that are given to you in that study Bible. It will help you to kind of begin to grasp some of this stuff. If you, your, your study Bible should reference you to particular scriptures. If if an old Testament uh, verse has been uh, referenced, go back and look at it, underline it and make sure you're kind of catching a grasp of it. Because the idea here is this, it's not that you're coming in and I'm telling you what you need to know. The idea is that I want to help you to become so familiar with the text that you're, again, not afraid to study it. You're not spooked out by every headline and every election and everything else. And that you're able to recognize the signs of the times that we're going through so that we can uh, sufficiently understand what God's doing in our lives right now. So that, again, so that we can share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And do something with the gospel of Jesus Christ because we understand the importance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we want people to get that message. Let me just finish by saying this. I was, I'll was, i mention some of this on Sunday morning. I've, I've been, uh, I came across this guy on social media who made a video and he said basically his whole deal was stop inviting people to church. And he's, his, his, he's not opposed to church. He said, but basically... If you invite people to church, they're not coming. They're, they don't, they've got other things to do, and it's just it's not that important. And I'm like, well, I mean, I, I'm not sure how you call yourself a pastor, and that's what he does. He calls himself a pastor. And he's saying, hey, stop inviting the people to church. I, I disagreed with him from the very beginning. What I was more interested in, it was not his horrible take on inviting people to church. What I was more interested in were the thousands of comments on the video And what I saw on there were people who were making all kinds of statements. Here's what some of the statements were. One of the statements was, my gym is my church. One person said that uh, church is too judgmental. And another person said church is not judgmental enough, that we basically have gotten soft and we're afraid to ruffle feathers. And so within two comments of one another, you had one person say, hey, you're too judgmental. And the other person said, you're not judgmental enough. And what I'm, what I'm trying to tell you here is this. There, is a, there, is, there are people out there who, like Pharaoh, have hardened their heart. And I don't care what message you take them, they will never say yes to Christ. And that's sad. And I, I, we, we should be praying for those people every time we get a chance. But within those same group of comments, there were people who were saying, we're just looking for community. We're looking for somebody that we can get together. They, I, had, I saw one comment that said, my grandmothers both were involved in church, and they knew everybody, and they hung out with those people. She goes, I have never been able to find that. There are people who have hardened their hearts to God, and they will never, they will never accept an invitation. They will never give their lives to Christ whatsoever, or to any other God for that matter. They just don't believe it whatsoever. There are others, they're searching for something and they don't even know what they're searching for. And those are the people that could be dramatically affected for eternity if somebody extended an invitation to them to hear the gospel. Not just come to church, but to hear the gospel. Which means that it is our job to establish Enough of a relationship to be able to have that conversation. Which means God's not done with you, right? Because a lot of people get in here and you go, well, I'm 60 years old. I'm 70 years old. I, I don't want to mess with the children's ministry anymore. And I, don't, I can't do this and I can't do that. That's fine. God might not have you ready to here in this church to do something in this church, right? We've got people that need to be ministered in, in, in here too. But we've got a community of people who are dying and going to hell out there because nobody has developed a relationship with somebody enough to be able to share the gospel with them. And that's what we're here to do. That's our purpose. That's our inheritance. That's our our title is to share the gospel, to grow the kingdom so that God can be glorified. Amen.